The following presentation is brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com. Welcome to Poker Road Radio, featuring the very best in pokertainment. Ah, uh, Barry Greenstein, Joe Seba, and Port Harrington. And now, here's your Poker Road host, Joe Stapleton. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to Poker Road Radio, brought to you by Tournament Poker Edge. Professional MTT training from the top live and online pros. Your hosts today are Joe Seabach, Court Harrington, poker legend Barry Greenside, and me. I'm a guy who thinks checking for pot control is something the DEA does. I am Joe Stapleton. We're coming to you from ETT London, sort of. That's where Barry Greenstein is. He is across the pond in Europe right this moment, live with us. Courtney Harrington from North Carolina, Joe Seabach, and John Vaughn from just a couple miles away wait, wait, wait. here in Was Los that- Angeles. Was that a drug joke that you made? Yeah. So you do drugs, is that what you're saying? No, I don't know poker, that's what I'm saying. I don't think so. I think you're making a marijuana reference, which says to me that you smoke marijuana. That's what what it says to me. I think that someone's perfectly capable of making a marijuana reference without necessarily having to smoke marijuana. In fact, do you have... Thanks. Do you just have a big long list of those jokes and you just pick one for each day, or do you come up with a new one before every show? No, I sit down and tear my hair out every day. Like thirty, like either I'll start an hour before the show, or I'll do it like like in the ten seconds leading up to the show. But it's difficult. I thought it was to- I thought it was totally impromptu. Like right as he's speaking, he just boom, just comes right out of his head. Oh wow! I wish it was. That'd be incredible if you could do that. Can you imagine thought- how much worse they would be if that were the case? I mean, they <laughs> suck as it is. I can only imagine if I like didn't even think about them ahead of time. I don't know. Oh, yeah, Back in 2006, you just made a list of about 500 of them, and you're just rolling through them one at a time. Yeah, exactly, except I've used 1,000 at this point, and there really is almost nothing left. There are like four poker j- jokes left in the entire universe, and I'm trying to find them right now. we got a great show for you guys coming up today. We've got Sieves again. We're going to talk to Sieves a little bit about what he's been up to since uh, the uh, yeah. Legends of Poker where he cashed. He's been all over the world. Uh, we've got Barry he, here. He's going to talk to us a little bit about EPT main event, as well as uh, the high roller. Did you play the high roller today, Barry? Uh, let's not talk about it. Yeah, no, All I right, did. there we go. Well, there's your answer right there. Yeah, I, say I that's saw a yes. Twitter. You didn't do it. It was rough today. Huh? I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like three hands uh, to tell the whole story. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to get to that story. Hopefully, we've got one poker news brief today. We've got a hand of the day, and in our last segment, we're going to we're catch up with some of the emails we haven't been able to get to in a very long time. First item up for bids, though, Joe Seabach. You finally got a new car, buddy. You cashed at the Legends of Poker, and you got a new car. Well, I didn't get it. I ordered it, because as it turns out, in Los Angeles, apparently people just don't drive stick shifts. It's just something that people do not do, despite the fact that, you know, I got the vehicle that I wanted for years and years and years and years. I got a Jeep, so I got a 2011 Jeep Wrangler. But, unfortunately, like I said, you can't just go run and pick it up, so I had to actually order it. So they have to go make it and all this kind of stuff. So So wait, so let me tell you, you're like the one guy in history that just paid more money for a standard transmission than an automatic? I might be. I didn't actually pay more. I asked if it cost more, and they said, no, it just takes some time. So it's going to be a month and a half before it actually gets here. Because automatic transmission is like a a feature. It's something you want in the car. No, I hate it. I don't understand people that, that, that drive automatics. You have so much less control. It's so much less fun. Like, I guess I can see the argument in traffic and all that kind of stuff. I can see that. But there's no way. Like, I've never had an automatic car. It's not my thing. Joe Seabach, I do not know how anyone could have less control behind the wheel of a car than you do, okay? <laughs> now, I figured, oh, you really? Know, you don't think so? You just well, take a ride. Buddy. You just drive around with Bear, and you'll see exactly see? who can have less control. That's true. Is I've he never, the one you know, that, that, I've never been in the car with Barry, but it's the technique of accelerating before you brake. Exactly. Yes, Joe (laughs) Seabach is like. It's not true. It's such bullshit. (laughs) It's such bullshit. I do not accelerate and brake at the same time. You guys are. You don't accelerate and brake at the same time. You accelerate into braking. Like you speed up to get to a red light so you can slam on the brakes when you get there. I do not do that. I do not do that. I take my foot off the gas and then I coast and then I brake. You guys are all. I think this goes back to your marijuana joke before. You're all stoned when you get in a car with me, so none of you can tell what's going on. Okay, I don't. Well, do I believe you that you're saying. I mean, Barry's had sex with enough Asian women in his life to probably be the worst Wor- driver of all time, like the worst God. Caucasian driver of all time. Why? So why? So well, I, I thought you meant. I thought you. 
See, I thought you meant while driving. <laughs> oh, oh, he made it worse. Somehow he made it worse. Why do, you guys, uh, do you understand the damage that you've done to me psychologically by all of your sexual jokes? Do you have any comprehension of what you've destroyed in me, Father? Uh, yeah, I, well, I do have a comprehension of what I've destroyed. I've had to counsel your girlfriends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And it's all your fault. It is all your fault. So anyone, any girl that I ever date for the rest of time, just know now, it's his fault, and he is going to have to counsel you. It's his fault. Well, well see, uh, uh, you know, it, what the problem was I misinterpreted the whole thing. When he was young, he said he wanted to watch for Christmas, so I let him. So ah, bro. That's so <laughs> That is such an old Thank man God joke, I Barry. I will say, like, you're kind of youthful at times, but that is a big-time old man joke. Holy shit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank God I never walked in on you or anything like that. I, I, I've got another old man thing when, the, when we talk a hand of the day. I've got, well, you know what, like when you're a kid and you see these old guys and you say, were they ever kids the way they act towards kids? So I've got one of those stories now. Uh, later, Perfect. later, when the hand of the day comes up. All right, we'll get to that in our second segment. For now, as long as we're sort of on video, I don't know if you'll be listening to this via podcast or watching the video. As long as we're on video, Joe, you know there's like a, a new trend in web videos called haul videos. Have you heard of them? I have not heard of them. Hauls are when these girls go out shopping and they come home and they're like, look what I got. I got this at the clinic counter and I got this at Express. Well, Joe, yeah. you just got back from Costa Rica and before we got on the air here, you were doing a little Costa Rican haul why don't you show everyone some of the souvenirs you brought back? Oh, the money. This is what I was showing everyone. I don't know if you guys can see it. I was showing the Costa Rican money that I brought back. See this? 10,000 colones. You know what this is worth? Nothing. That's not even worth anything. It's not even worth having. That's what it's worth. Not even worth having. Okay? I don't, I don't have... You know, it's funny because I'm sitting here. I'm going through... I didn't actually get this in um, Costa Rica, but I just have this weird box. Because we're used to doing the radio, right? So normally we're talking, we're doing stuff, we're kind of fiddling around. So now that I'm on video, I have to remember I can't just do stuff because this is eventually going to be on the site. So thank you for bringing this to my attention. I need to kind of <laughs> <rein> myself in. <laughs> and you showed me a watch, too. What was the watch from? Oh, yeah, this watch was given to me. See, this is a real haul now. You'll remember, Bear, actually, this was given to me by my girlfriend in high school, Cynthia. Remember Cynthia, Bear? Of course I remember Cynthia. Remember? Of course I remember Cynthia. She fucked like a minx. Oh. Yeah. So gross. She was a. She was a good girlfriend of ours, as I remember. She's a real intelligent girl. Yeah, she's really smart. She is a good girl. But that's so all. That's all in Seabox like walk through memory lane for today though. Well, why did you go down to Costa Rica? Did you go down there for them to pay you in cash and you had to bring it home or what? <laughs> no. Ho ho ho. Uh, no, basically I went down there, it's been a year since I've been down, um, so I went down, there's a lot of new, you know, obviously all the scandal is, is still going on, we haven't gotten all the information that we want from the hand histories, um, although I feel, you know, pretty good about a lot of the other stuff, um, but I hadn't been down in a year, I wanted to go down, and not only, hopefully, you know, sew up some of that stuff, get some of the final answers along those lines, but start to, you know, move some new objectives, you know, sort of down the line, obviously I want to get more involved in the marketing, you know, I'd like to be more involved, sort of, in, in all this, all everything that sort of faces, you know, the public, basically. Um, so I went down there, had great meetings for a couple weeks. You know, obviously worked through a lot of stuff. Um, there, in the next week or so, I mean, it's always the next week or so. Um, we ended up closing an office um, in, I believe it was Toronto, and getting a bunch more data about uh, the final hand history stuff. So that should be coming soon from Paul. So that's a little update along those lines. And uh, then, you know, again, I just wanted to get more involved in the marketing side of it. So we discussed that, and hopefully I'll be uh, be able to get my hands, you know, uh, sort of more hands-on in terms of what we're going to do and, and what sort of marketing pushes we're going to have moving forward. So that was kind of what I spent two weeks down there for. So I just got back. So, um, you know, also we haven't talked about the fact since we talked to you last on the radio show, UB put out the screen names. Is that what happened on Wicked Chops? Well, UB didn't put out anything. It wasn't like UB okay. put it out. But basically, what happened was, um, you know, and it's been covered before during the World Series and everything, but obviously one of the things I wanted to do was get as many of these physical names out as was humanly possible. Um, so, you know, over the course of many, many months, I've worked with Mookman, you know, over on the 2 plus 2 forums. 
you know, put together a list of my own, chatting with, you know, a whole host of different sources. You know, Bear was involved in a lot of that since he's sort of an old schooler and he's been around a lot of these guys. Um, and then Wicked Chops, those guys were able to really kind of build the meat for the skeleton and just, again, talk to these people, go out there, make phone calls, you know, inquire, try to get people to comment. Um, and then that was released, obviously, you know, a few months ago. And to this point, I mean, I, I'm very, very happy with that information. I mean, there's always sort of people who feel like, well, you know, we can't trust this or this isn't the correct information out there. But for everything that I have spent time on over the last year with regards to the actual physical names of these guys, this is the most accurate story that we've been able to put together. So at this point, you know, and again, I hope it's not the end of it. I mean, our hope was always that we would put it out, people would seize upon it, and then it would continue to grow. You know, obviously in a perfect world, one of these big name people hopefully starts talking and then the whole thing spills out. You know, that was always sort of my hope, um, and I still hope that happens. Um, I'm just not sure how much more I can physically do to get these particular names out, you know, at this point. But I hope they do come out. And also, right before we went down there, go ahead, Barry. Yeah, one of the things, Joe, you know, Joe's worked pretty hard on this stuff, and obviously he didn't come in knowing anything. He has to leverage what they're giving him at UB. There's always a question of, is he getting accurate information? But it's frustrating for both of us that, a lot of times they're blaming the messenger. You know, people are like upset at Joe, who's just telling the truth and trying to find out what he's got. You know, trying to give us what he's got. Even you know, I'm not happy with it a lot of times too. But like, we even have the guy who is the guy, uh, not never when. Uh, what, what's his name? Todd Metellus. He writes this thing right. saying, "Well, Joe didn't put out the screen names. He didn't do certain things." And Joe said, "Why would you lie? Why would you say I didn't do the stuff that I actually did?" And then his right. excuse was, "Well, how do I know it's the truth?" And we said, well, obviously, you don't know if it's the truth or not, but you can't just say you didn't do it. You can say, I don't believe it, and I haven't believed the stuff I've gotten from UB, which, you know, I don't believe everything I get, we get from them either. Uh, you know, Joe's on the fence. He's saying, well, I don't have any evidence. It's not true. But the point is for people to act like he didn't do anything is it, it, it makes it so it's the end of the discussion. You can't even talk to them. Right. No, I'm trying to act that. like he didn't do anything. Yeah. Right. And I appreciate that. And, you know, Bear's right. It, 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 here's the truth. If people have decided, hey, man, this is the deal, we're not comfortable with UB, we're just not going to work with them, we feel like they're not honest with us, then I say, you know what, I completely respect your point of view, I respect your opinion, I would never, you know, try to, to talk you out of that, but there's just simply nothing that I can do moving towards into the future, right? If somebody feels that way and they're not going to trust me, then I respect you, there's nothing I can do. I can't, there's no way I can make you trust me. If you don't trust me, then clearly we don't need to have a conversation because it, it's not going to go anywhere. You know. Right, but they can't say that you didn't do what you said you would do. You you are doing wow. it. You're in the process of doing it. People can say whatever they want, you know. And I have a lot of fans, and I have a lot of detractors, and I'm okay with that either way. Um, the most important thing to me is I have done, you know, right by myself in the situation. You know, I, I have certainly never lied about anything. I've certainly, you know, never found out information that I then buried or you know tried to make sure no one else found. Um, and it's always been sort of this search for truth, you know, and I feel like as much truth has been able to be uncovered, at least to this point, you know, we've put out there. So I'm very, very comfortable with that, even if other people, you know, feel, you know, they're angry or, you know, they feel like I haven't done what I said I would do. You know, I feel that I have to the best of my ability to this point. And, Joe, just one more quick question. I believe that, uh, was it Sirius was sold recently or just UB? And are you, yeah. Is your job okay? Is everything, is anything going to change? <laughs> My, my job is fine. I, they've actually upgraded me to prime minister, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, basically the Sirius Network was sold um, to sort of they, they ended up putting a, together a company. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, was, uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't an old existing company that came in and scooped it up. It's a uh, – gosh. They basically they built like a vehicle for acquisition. You know, Stuart Gordon, who's a guy who's been around, he's done a lot of things with – Bingomania.com. He's sort of been in online gaming, but not in online poker. So this is sort of his first foray into that. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think they move a little bit further away from again, you know, the old owners. And obviously, the, all of the, the drama and all the cheating was were it was tied to this particular group, which uh, basically was uh, Excapsa. So we move further away from them. You know, it's just another level less that we have to deal with the scandal. Um, so it, I think it's just all around a, a really, really good situation. Um, but in terms of business, it's basically going to be business as usual. You know, I don't think that, that very much is going to change over at Sirius, you know, UB or AP. 
um, until so, sort of some of the legality gets sorted out, you know, in, in the United States. And then who knows what could happen? I mean, they could be sold, they could continue. I mean, I don't think anybody knows that. But for the time being, there's not going to be a big shift um, to the public in what goes on over at UB or AP right now. All right, there you have it from Ultimate Bach himself, all the latest on UB. We've got to take a break right now. But before we do, I implore you guys to go check out Tournament Poker Edge. Uh, it's an online training course, 20 bucks a month, no contract, no minimum months you have to join for it. Dip in, dip out, hit and run, just like in the poker world, like you're not supposed to do. And uh, it's all multi-table stuff. So, you know, if you're the kind of player that plays a $20 multi-table tournament because you want to take up an afternoon, these guys can really help you out. And uh, hopefully you'll be cashing those things like no time. We are taking a break right now. But when we get back, Cobra Road Radio will be back with lots more stuff. Every Sunday night at 9.15 East Coast Time, the Poker Road League meets at Broadway Tables for Season 6. This is a weekly No Limit Hold'em MTT with a $33 buy-in, a $50 bounty, $1,000 in value added to the leaderboard, and over $3,000 in value added to the championship game. Don't wait until next season to get started. The top 80% of the leaderboard will qualify for the championship event, so it's never too late to get in on the action. A flattened payout featuring 9 caches means you rack up points and roll over your cash into a buy for the next event. After just four events, almost $3,000 have been wagered and $200 in bounties collected. Details are available at PokerRoad.com and BroadwayTables.com. So meet us at Broadway Tables Sundays at 9.15 p.m. for the Poker Road League. All right, listen up, poker players, because I've got some positive fashion EV advice for you. Don't think there's a such thing as positive fashion EV? Well, stick around, because I've got the latest news from BustOutPoker.com. BustOutPoker.com has been busy adding players to their team and gear to their store. Check out brand new premium Bust Out U hoodies in the online store, along with old Bust Out favorites like I Am Izzle Dur One Tees and Team Bust Out Hats. So head over to BustOutPoker.com right now and pick up the gear that gave Team Bust Out Pro Chad Brown the ultimate fashion ROI, Vanessa Russo. That's BustOutPoker.com. Check it out at BustOutPoker.com. Hey, MTT players. Tired of training sites that focus on cash games with only the occasional tournament video? Well, I'm Casey, Big Dog Pocket 5 Jarzebeck, Card Player's number one ranked online tournament player, and I'd like to tell you about TournamentPokerEdge.com, where you can learn to ship it like the big dog. TournamentPokerEdge.com focuses exclusively on tournaments and offers innovative training for low, mid, and high stakes players. And for only $19.95 a month with no sign up fee, TournamentPokerEdge.com is the perfect way for you to start learning how to crush tournaments today. Welcome back to Poker Road Radio, brought to you by Tournament Poker Edge Professional MTT Training from the top live and online pros. Barry, you remember that song? That was, a, that was playing at uh, when you turned 40, right? I was thinking that's probably before you guys were born. Um, as a matter of fact, to see you guys kind of rocking out and makes me like want to do the robot or something. But uh, I don't think it would go. I don't think it would go over too well. You know. I don't. Uh, did, have you ever done the robot, or would this be your first? I mean, sometimes I think you're a robot, like you're a poker playing robot that just goes into a closet and powers down at the end of the night. But uh, I can't imagine you doing the robot. I'm actually a pretty good dancer in my mind, but uh, I've found I've seen, that when I – go ahead, Joe. I've seen you dance one time in my entire life, one time. And, you, and, that, and then you turned away or what? Well, I thought that you got bit by something, so I was running to get, you know, like uh, <laughs> some sort of paddles or something to bring to resuscitate you. 
Yeah, it's, it's too bad because uh, my girlfriend's a good dancer, so it was a bad match there. <laughs> well, what can you do, Barry? It's all right. You, uh, you know, you got you, you've other skills, and one of those skills is, I guess, uh, playing poker. Barry, I, what I wanted to ask you about one thing is that you're up for the uh, Hall of Fame induction this year. How do you feel about that? And also, where is the poker vote going? I don't know if Poker Road has a vote, do they? Oh, okay. We, I know. we had, had one last year. We almost – no, we didn't have one. We didn't have one last year? No, basically what happened was the first Hall of Fame voting, um, we were, like, just about to get it. If I pushed for it, we could have gotten one. But I just kind of let it go because I had too many other things going on. So as of right now, we don't. We could probably get one if we really, really wanted one. Yeah, yeah. The, the real truth, Joe, is when I read, like, I, I – you know, I don't really pay attention to the Hall of Fame, but I read different websites – so, like, I saw some guy, or Alex was reading this. It's like most of the stuff they put out about the candidates is fictitious. It's a total uh-huh. joke. It's like it's like poker's almost anecdotal, except for tournament results. And even that, there was some guy on one of the websites, I, I think it's one of your friends, either Wicked Chops or one of the others, because Alex saw it, where the guy said, uh-huh. well, Barry's never cashed in the main event, which is uh-huh. ridiculous. I mean, they, all they have to do is go and look at my results, and they can see I've cashed several times in the main event. The first year I ever played it, I, I actually had a chance to win, and I come, came in 22nd. So it's like, I don't know why they write this stuff. That, and then they write about who's a cash game player and who isn't, and they make up stuff. It's like they don't know because how people have done you – know, one of the criteria is supposed to be playing against top competition. Uh, I guess nowadays you could say they also in terms, but in cash games, the stuff they say about the players is their guess, which is way off. So I'm not really into the Hall of Fame thing that much because they are voting on people who don't even exist, if you know what I mean. Right. They think they, think they know, and I don't know where they're, you know, the people are getting their information, but I don't think I've ever read anything that's very accurate about people. Would you say with, that, with you all know, the sort said, of... I just wanted to say that, that Poker Road has purchased uh, 30 minutes of airtime on Versus coming up yeah, in the right. uh, Vote for Greenstein campaign. <laughs> yeah, so right, right. while they may be feeding you misinformation, <laughs> we will be feeding you true information. So tune in. We're going to tell you what Bear's all about. Yeah, yeah Bear, you know, it- for, my, for myself, Joe, sorry, my career's not over. I'm going to do some more things, and, uh, you know, it's not it's not a big deal to me one way or the other. Um, the only time it even irritates is when I hear people say I heard someone once say, well, he hasn't been playing poker long enough. No, I've been a professional poker player for over 40 years, longer than almost than some of those guys are old. But they have these stories. They think, like, I was a, a computer programmer who retired and became a poker player. They just make things up they don't know, so they make stuff up. I mean, obviously, I've been playing poker longer than any of them, including the ones who are older than me, like Dan Harrington, who really hasn't played poker straight through. You know, I played the most hours of poker of any of the people, so that one's kind of weird. Um, uh, myself, I would probably vote for Linda Johnson, to tell you the truth, because she's contributed a lot to poker. She gave her you know, her life, really, to poker and making poker bigger, kind of like Mike Sexton did also. So even though you know she did some things as a player also, she is a woman who won a, an open uh, World Series of Poker title. Not many have. And... Uh, um, and on the play side, the way I look at it is Phil's done the most of the players. So if I was going to pick a player, I'd pick Phil over the rest of them, regardless that he's younger than the rest of us. Well, that's I a good question like, that everyone always talks about, Bear. So you don't think that there should be, like, a minimum age or anything like that, like other sports, quote-unquote? Um, I don't really think that because poker you can play longer. You know, If you look at it this way, if you go back, I got to, you know, since I was older than Phil, obviously at one point I'd accomplished more in poker than him. I've certainly played in the biggest games longer than him still because I'm older than him uh, and longer than anyone else uh, that they could have on the, on the panel or on the, uh, on the list. But, uh, um, you know, at some point when you talk about major tournaments, if you go back, let's say, a couple of years ago, I had, uh, you, know, three or, you know, three to five major tournaments, if you count World Series, a poker and world poker tours, and Phil had about the same. He maybe had five bracelets and no world poker tour titles. Well, then he went out and he won three more bracelets and a world poker tour title during a, a span of time where I really didn't do much, and I'm not sure who else on the list did too much either. So if we were all about even a couple of years ago, Phil did more than we did the last couple of years. We all had the opportunity to do that. 
I think my vote, I liked uh, Linda Johnson as a choice, too, actually. I, I, the playing at the highest of stakes, I think there should be exceptions here and there for people who, uh, you know, who have really grown the game and who truly deserve to be in a Hall of Fame of poker. Barry, as long as we're talking about you and your stuff, EPT London main event, you must have busted out on your day one. Uh, no. No, you made it to day two. I was short when I made it to day two. I, I didn't uh, really do much day one. I got down to 6,000, which was four big blinds. Can I tell my hand of the day now? Absolutely. Hold on. Do we, I don't know if we want. I don't know if we want to play a. I don't know if we want to play a bumper for hand of the day, or if we want to uh, just let him do it. Do we have a bumper, John V? There we go. Hand of the day. I got down to six thousand at eight and sixteen hundred. I had less than four. Or fewer than four big blinds, I guess you would say, or less, depends on the integers. But anyway, uh, so I was really short and about to go in, and uh, a really funny thing happened. It was a European kid. He was on the button, and I was in the small blind. And the dealer flipped over his first card, and it was a king, and kept dealing. And when he got a second card, he, he starts screaming and got a replacement, and he for the for the king, and he throws his cards at the dealer, and he starts you you whatever you know he dealt me two kings on the button and screwed up my hand, and this is where I was talking about I don't want to be the old man who doesn't understand children, I don't want to but I said to the guy, okay he made a mistake you don't have to act like a child, and then he said come on man he says I really respect you come on don't be so hard on me. And I said, yeah. I said, I said, yeah, it's tough, but you know, uh, you know, it happens, you know. And uh, I, I said, the truth is, you should be getting a penalty for folding out a turn. Right. I'm not going to call on you, but if this were America, you'd be getting a penalty right now. And uh, so now, everybody folds to the guy to his right, right of the button, who starts saying, like, what's the deal here? You know, he folded out a turn, and he looked kind of weak. And the guy raises, and now I have to decide with my Jack-10 off suit whether to go all in at this point. And like I said, I've got under four big blinds, and I wouldn't have folded if he was in true cutoff. But now that he's really the button because the other guy's folded out of turn, I was thinking maybe this is my best shot. I've got some money in already. Maybe I should call here. But you hate calling and then finding out the guy had a legitimate hand, and it was just this whole misdeal thing. That's a little irritating, too. So I folded and the big blind folded, and now the guy who had raised in the cutoff, he did a good acting job. He now turns over his hand. He had two aces. Uh -oh. And the guy who claimed to have folded two kings is now feeling even more sheepish. Because <laughs> he had like 150, and the other guy had 100,000, and he would have lost probably 100,000 on his hand, but most likely. Because also somebody else said they folded a king. He was going to be in bad shape. Uh, so now we go to the break. He tracks me down, and he finds me again. And uh, he says, hey, man, I'm sorry, you know, all this type of stuff. But here's something really important that I didn't say to him because he, he was getting real apologetic. And, and uh, one thing, poker really has, in my opinion, how you act in poker has a lot to do with how you act in life. If you're abusive, especially to women dealers, you probably aren't that good to your girlfriend, in my opinion. And the one thing that I would want to say to anyone who's abusive like this and folds out a turn, what you're really saying is, I don't care about anything, anyone else. It's all about me. I got my feelings hurt here. The guy ruined my hand. And so it doesn't matter if I screw up the game because I don't care about anyone else. And just think if this guy is in a relationship, he's just saying, no one else matters. So you see how, to me, it's a much bigger thing than throwing your cards in. It's the statement you're making about yourself. And uh, I didn't go off on the guy and tell him what I was really thinking. But I almost, no, I almost really wanted to because I think it might have woken him up. Maybe to go on over his head. But for anyone out there who's always doing these things in poker, that throwing cards and doing this, remember, it's not all about you in poker or in life. You really do have to consider that it's uh, it's other people's game too, and so act like a man. And uh, yeah, you're unhappy. We'd all be unhappy in this situation, 
but I know I got to this guy, and I didn't mean to. I didn't want to get to him. He ended up bluffing off. He had good chips enough to get the money, and in the next two rounds, he threw all his chips away. He was out on two ridiculous bluffs. Yeah. Yeah, well, he tilted himself. Like that, though, right? Because obviously he can't control himself in the first place. Right. Exactly. I'd imagine someone that can't keep from throwing their cards at the dealer can't keep from punting, you know, the very first chance he gets. Barry, I agree with everything you said except for the fact that talking to him maybe would have gotten through to him. I don't think so. People like that usually don't uh, – aren't very easily to get through to, but – Hey, it's entirely possible. Hopefully he listens to this show. Barry, I had one other question about a hand that you played at the World Series of Poker Europe. Maybe you can't share it with me or not. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, and that is from the button, Barry Greenstein raises, and then Nicholas Levy re-raised to 17000 from the small blind. After the big blind folded, Greenstein four bet to 50000 Levy thought for a minute or two before moving all in for about 175000 and Greenstein mucked. Can you tell us what you had on that hand? This is no limit hold'em? Yeah, that's no limit from the World Series of Poker Europe from, oh, yeah, I think yeah. it was yeah. the third event. I didn't know his, he was Nicholas Levy. I think that guy's been doing pretty well. If I'd have known his name, maybe I wouldn't have done it. What <laughs> had happened was uh, um, I had Jack Ted offsuit that hand, actually, also. And, uh, uh, you know, I was four betting as a bluff. This guy had been aggressive enough. I don't want people three betting me too much. And I had just gotten to my high point, actually. And uh, I just thought he was, you know, it was big blind, sm uh, small, or sorry, I was on the button, he was in the small blind. I just didn't think he had anything. The only thing that I wished I had done differently, maybe, was my bet size on my uh, four bet, because I pretty much put him in a move in or fold position. And I might have, you know, if I would raised a little less, it might have cost me more. It also might have looked str uh, stronger instead of weaker. It might have looked like I was trying to force him out. I don't know what he had. Maybe he, already, he did have aces, kings, race, king. He took about two minutes before he shipped. But if I had raised less, maybe he would have just called. Maybe he wouldn't have felt like he was in that position. And I might have been able to take it away uh, on the flop. All right, cool. Yeah, I read that update, and I was like, I got to know what, Bar what moves Barry's making with these things. You know, I didn't know if you were like, Folding kings to a five bet, or if you were trying to make a move with a four bet, and then uh... no, I, I, I was I was making a move. I had nothing, but that's just for you people out there. Read the forums. I'm a tight player. It's the only move I'll make. <laughs> I'm not going to do that ever again. <laughs> All right, John. Do we have a bumper for poker news? I want to do one quick poker news story. Bringing you the biggest stories, or well, whatever we could find ten minutes before the show. Poker news. All right, Poker Stars actually withdrew, no longer accepts players from the state of Washington. Poker Stars' statement on the blocking of players of Washington is Poker Stars say announced that it would cease providing real money poker to residents of Washington State. To date, Poker Stars has operated in Washington on the basis of legal opinions, where the central advice was that the state could not constitutionally regulate internet poker, or at least could not discriminate in favor of local card rooms and against online sites. Last week, however, the Washington Supreme Court for the first time rejected that position and upheld the state's Internet gaming prohibition. The statement goes on to just talk about how they, you know, they want to do the right thing and respect the laws and so, so on and so forth. Uh, to me, this, this seems like a bad thing to me. Obviously, it's, it's a bad thing. To, it, to me, what I'm really afraid of is that other states might see that this worked and sort of go after <coughs> the same sort of legislation. Barry, what do you think? Well, what was going on here is uh, we're expecting regulation to come soon. And one of the items in the regulation was that anyone who violated the law, will ha they don't want to give them a license. Okay. One second. I guess they're done for the day, I think. Um, anyway... Um, I'm waiting for Thomas Kremser to finish talking. No problem. He, he's the Matt Savage of Europe. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, um, so Poker Stars has always maintained that they've never violated the law because it's not illegal to play poker online. It's illegal to have a. Oh, you're kidding me. Alex just said Chino, Chino, busted, Chino busted 25th. We were going to get Chino on the show. Wow. Chino was the chip leader about an hour ago. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, Love it, Tina. It's too bad we didn't come on Poker Radio, Poker Road Radio first. Come on Poker Road, make a final table. He was just a hair too late. Yeah. So, so, so anyway, um, so Poker Road feels, or sorry, Poker Stars feels, which I agree with, they've never violated the law. It's illegal to, have to for them to be based in the United States, which they're not. And it's illegal for it's legal for us to play poker online as players. Obviously, we do it openly. There's nothing wrong with that. But now that some states are saying in their state it's not legal, Poker Stars has no choice. But so they can still maintain they haven't done anything illegal. If they serve people in Washington, and we may have that same thing in Kentucky coming up, then people can say, hey, it was clearly an illegal thing that you did here. You can't be licensed. So that's Poker Star's point of view. They aren't going to do anything illegal. They don't want to jeopardize getting licensed. Now, on the other hand, this whole thing about uh, uh, the law in Washington, no one's ever been arrested in Washington for playing poker online, uh, as far as I know. The whole reason it's, it is illegal there has nothing to do with gambling. It has to do with the governor got a lot of money for her campaign from the Indian gaming casinos, and they feel online poker competes with them, so they told the governor, throw us a bone. Make it illegal in your state uh, to justify all those all the millions of dollars we gave you. And so it's just, uh, you know, she's been bought. It's simple. I mean, if you want to be hardcore about it, it's uh, just another corrupt politician who's uh, been bought, you know, and so she should be out of there. I mean, it's about time that people see these politicians get bought by the special interest and make these rulings because they've been given money and get rid of them. I mean, why do we have these uh, goofy politicians in there anyway? Our country's really in trouble. Washington, the politicians fight with each other. Nothing gets done. The Republicans don't uh, want the Democrats to get credit for anything, so they're always standing in the way. The Democrats don't want the Republicans to get credit. They'll stand in the way if we have a Republican contrast, uh, Congress. We really have a screwed-up system right now. I had hoped with Obama things wouldn't be so... Uh, uh, you know, the way they are, you know, polarizing, polarized, where it's either you're all Democrat or all Republican, but unfortunately he didn't get it done. Uh, and uh, we got a messed up group of politicians right now. We should, we should get rid of all of them. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there are some good ones, but very few. I mean, when I get this stuff where uh, I get it in the mail, vote Democratic, don't keep the Republicans out. Whatever happened to vote for the best idea? Right. Whether it's Republican or Democratic idea. That's like gone by the wayside. Ideas don't hold the day anymore. It's Democrat, Republican, special interest, money. That's what politics is these days, and we've really, we're really in trouble. We've got a lot of wastage, and I'm surpri surprised our, our country is even surviving with <laughs> all the waste and all the uh, politicians trying to make sure nobody can get anything done. Well, you know, to bring it back to poker for a second, Poker Stars is shut down for residents of the state of Washington. Do you think we'll see some of the other sites follow suit? And if they don't, will that put Poker Stars in a better position once things do become legalized here? I assume they'll all have to do it for the same reason. Okay. All right, well, uh, we'll have to follow and see which, you know, some of the other sites don't always seem like they want, you know, full tilt. There's all kinds of things going on about them, and UB has the bad reputation, so who knows? You know, maybe these guys will just decide they don't want to. Seabock, I'm sure you're all over it. I'm sure you're going to make sure that that as the Prime Minister of UB, that they will make the best decision possible. We're going to take another break right now. When we get back, we're going to answer all of your emails. Maybe Chino Reem will stop by. I doubt it at this point. He's probably already on a plane back to the U.S. For radio. Back after this. Support Poker Road and get money back at the same time. PokerRoad.com is now offering an exclusive Poker Road rake back program. Get 27 to 40 percent back from sites like Full Tilt Poker, Doyle's Room, and Cake Poker. Increase your earning power with cash prizes from our rake races and chases. 24/7 support, a Poker Road forum dedicated to rake back, and new promotions each month. Plus, more sites to be added soon. Go to PokerRoad.com and click the rake back button for more info and deals. Poker Road Rakeback, the only way to earn money and support the best poker site in the world, all at the same time. The Poker Beat. Serious poker news. 
for the thinking fan. BJ Nemeth and Dan Mahowski to talk Celebrity Apprentice right after this on the Poker Beat. So what what was going on in the blogosphere as this was all happening uh, as it pertains to the poker community that you could see? And how's your traffic, Dan? How's your traffic that night? Well, it was it was great. It was I got to say for Sunday evening is usually one of the slowest times of the week for uh, internet poker related traffic and we were having a uh, WSOP size numbers during that Sunday night wow. about the night. And uh, you know, I mean people were people were into it and it really was funny to see uh, what kind of searches people uh, brought people to the site? You know, you want to hear you want to hear some of the things that uh, that brought people to the site. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, please. So some of the searches we got: Annie Duke best bull- job, Joan Rivers bull- win, is Celebrity Apprentice fixed? Annie Duke Apprentice cleavage. Who is Annie Duke? Randy Roderick blow. Sh-. Hitler blow. Sh-. Want. That gets the howl. The poker beat. Live Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time, exclusively on PokerRoad.com. Let's go, guys. What up, Tom? What's up, dude? What's, What's going on, brother? Um, not too much. Just trying to trying to file a table on the EPT. So, yeah. Now, you've got a pretty good track record lately. You've won hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last year, if I'm not mistaken, in tournaments. What's your figure at right now? Um, I think it's 1.6 million for a There you go. Sure. That's more than hundreds of thousands. That's in the millions. I didn't want to say more than a million, just in case it was less than a million, because I figured it would be a bummer. I'd rather come in too low and have you tell me more. Yeah, fair enough. I'm well over a million. So it's been and uh, this particular tournament, you're obviously still alive on day three. Where's your chip stack? Um, I have a bit over a million, and I, I think the average, I'm about average. So with 24 left, the blinds are just 10, 20,000. So 50 big blinds. We'll see what happens. Have you, uh, have you been all in at all in this tournament? Has it been smooth sailing for you? Um, actually, earlier in the day, I got all in with eights versus King Queen versus Chino, and he he turned a queen, Night River, and eight to stay alive. Oh, so I mean, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Prime definitely. sweat, prime like kicking someone's head in, like just all around the best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went with the the get up maneuver on the river, and that that works a lot apparently. It's uh, nice to rebank there, and since then I kind of just chipped my way up to what I'm at now. <laughs> Now, is there ever at any point, uh, either after that hand or before, where you got yourself into a situation like any particularly interesting hands that weren't necessarily at all in pre-flop? Um, to be honest, it was a really easy day for me. There just wasn't much three betting going on. It was just like a lot of raising and taking down pots, or con- continuation betting and taking down pots. I'm trying to think of the. Be- oh, actually, there was there was one good pot I right. played that that I knocked somebody out on after. It was. A middle position player opened who started the hand with about 40 big blinds. He had been kind of tight. And then Kevin Stanny, he's the player who won EPT Talon, he called in the small blind. I had Ace King in the big blind with 76,000. Or no, and I made it 76,000. The first razor folding, and then Kevin from the small blind made it 200,000. And with about 300 behind. And I kind of brain farted and meant to go all in with Ace King, but instead I just said call. So <laughs> it was a bit, it was, it was a bit awkward when the flop came eight seven two, but he jumped on like I, I I just thought he'd have like Ace Queen enough where I where I'd get there, and uh, he had Ace Queen and I held. So that was a that was the pot that got me up to a little over a million. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh. That's uh that's a pretty good brain fart to have. Although maybe if you had shoved oh. ahead of time, he'd have looked you up with Ace Queen anyway. Yeah, I think he does look me up anyway. I mean, it was really, it was really bad by me because I said, because I even said out loud, ah, if you're if you're trapping, you got me, and then I said call. So I thought it was pretty clear probably that I had uh, jacks or better or like ace king. So I was pretty lucky to have him bluff the flop with ace queen there. Yeah. Now, Tom, you've been having a really ridiculous uh, year. Do you think has that allowed you to play even better? Do you play with more confidence now, knowing that no matter what, you've already won 1.6 million this year? <laughs> Um, definitely. I mean, once you start getting the results, you kind of get a feel for what it takes to go deep. And you see it really is just like a lot of solid play and a good round of cards. I mean, these live tournaments are just extremely soft, I feel like. So, I mean, it run good, and it seems like if you get chips late, it's not that difficult to make a run to a final table. Did you play World Series of Poker Europe before this, or did you only come in for EPT? Um, I, ju- I just came to... 
to London for the main event, World Series Poker Europe's main event, and I missed the preliminary events. I, I just busted day one in the World Series Poker Europe main event. So how do you compare field strength to, say, the World Series of Poker Europe versus EPT London? Um, the World Series of Poker Europe was probably one of the toughest fields I've played all year. I mean, I don't know if Harris and just the World Series of Poker does a bad job putting it on, but they just don't get recreational players into the tournament. And since it's like a prestigious World Series of Poker main event, you get all the pros turning out. So, I mean, I'd say the World Series of Poker Europe was like the toughest event I've played all year. And these EPTs are, I mean, they're... they're we lost your audio for a second, Tom. Hold on one second. Just go ahead and uh, give me a little... There you go. You're back. You're back. Uh, so you're saying okay, that you, yeah, would, yeah. you would definitively rather face a field of 848 online qualifiers versus 150 or 200 of, like, the, the top of the top, um, the cream of the crop. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's fun to play against the, all these other good players, and I feel that I'm still a winner in the field for sure. But at the same time, it's, it's like, tough. You're put in way more uh, difficult spots where you have to make tough decisions. And, I mean, just value-wise, it's if, if there wasn't the EPT here, I'd say it'd be difficult to, to like, even come to London for a World Series of Poker Europe because there's just not enough value to cover all the expenses. So the World Series of Poker Europe is kind of like a fantasy camp where you get to play with all the pros and it costs you 10,000 pounds. Then you go down the road to EPT London and you have a chance of actually making some real money. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd, I'd imagine that World Series of Poker Europe has the opportunity to take off in the future. It just seems like there needs to be, like, online sats and maybe the venue has to be better because the venue is really small and just can't handle that many players. But, I mean, until they do make some changes, I think it's just going to become less and less popular. Now, you're, uh, you're heading into tomorrow into day four. You said you're around average, probably midway uh, up through the field, chip stack-wise. Do you know what your table draw is going to be yet? Have you looked it up? Um, the day literally just ended, so I don't know as of yet. But usually, now, usually in, they... In a field like this, uh, you know, it's probably a little bit harder to know all your competition. Do you think you have a good read on most of the other players' games, or are you just kind of guessing at them by their sort of uh, archetype? Um, I'll usually go into play being, like, cautious and uh, base some of my reads off of, like, the common stereotypes in poker. But, I mean, at the same time, I, I usually look everyone up on Hendon Mob before uh, the day starts. So I have an idea of who's an amateur and who, who's, like, put in some volume in live tournaments. All right, fantastic, Tom. Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it. Best of luck, although you don't really need it. I mean, you've won plenty this year, but there is a phrase on Poker Road. It goes, come on, Poker Road, make a final table. You've already made a bunch already. Let's make it one more tomorrow or the next day, whenever you get there, Tom. Thanks a lot for being with us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Have a good one. See you later, Tom. All right, yep. we're going to get Gary back in his seat here on Poker Road Radio. Tom, Tom is kind of a beast, man. I remember we had him on if you were well, back in San Jose. And he's yes. hot off of, you know, a final table or, you know, something crazy. So he, this year has been spectacular for that kid. Yeah, it's been a pretty ridiculous year for Tom. And uh, nice job, Barry. Nice, nice, grabbing a, nice grabbing a guest on the fly. Well, you know, they say uh, we're not getting enough young kids. Actually, uh, I just asked him what happened to Chino, and he started telling me Chino threw his chips away here. So uh, I guess he didn't want to come on the show. Well, yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. Chino, Chino's a bit of a wild card at the table, I'd say. He's perfectly capable of going from first to worst in three or four hands, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You guys want to do uh, You guys want to do some emails? Let's knock some emails out, and then let's call it a day from Europe, huh? Sure, buddy. Let's do it. Yeah. Who the hell is this? Emailing me at 11.26. Send me an email with all the details. You've got mail. 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 All right, here we go. This first email is from Dave, who says, I heard the tail end of the last show from the Detox series. By the time it got to angle shooting range, I was laughing so hard I peed a little. I think the Stapes Wellman Fricky is my favorite combo outside of Gavin and Seabock. Not to kiss ass too hard, but I enjoy Stapes hosted shows way more than the Ali ones. His weird slang, Iranian Ebonics. I didn't know this was going to trash out. I'm <laughs> skipping that part. <laughs> I'm, I'm already a fan of oh, Stapes yeah. on the two decks. What's that, Barry? 
Yeah, if they had said I like Ollie a lot better than Stapes, you'd still be reading this, right? Oh, oh, I mean, oh, 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 actually... I'm actually way more likely to read one that is uh, that hates me than someone that hates someone else because I think it's funny when they hate me, but it makes me look really bad if I read an email about them hating someone else. Anyway, this guy goes on to say, I'm already a fan of Stapes on two jacks in the hole, and I think Jess Wellman is a strong asset to both Poker Road and the Poker Beat. She's a superstar in the making. The combination of her and Jimmy works really well, I think. Both of them are better for being paired. I'm a month behind my listening, so I have no idea what the current or future lineups may be, but I love the combo of you three. Keep up the good work. Well, Dave, thank you very much for the email. Hopefully you will like me and Barry Court as well. I love having Barry you. on the show personally because uh, I get to take a lot of time off from talking when he's here. Uh, <laughs> this guy, I, I didn't get his name. I take the whole time off. There, yeah, I know. Yeah, Court, Court, you. Court, you don't even talk, buddy. What's going on over there? Yeah. It's they hard to jump on. By the time I get ready to say something, y'all have moved on. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only thing that's slow in North Carolina. Uh, this guy, uh, I yeah. left his name off the email, but he says, uh, I love Poker Road Radio, but Jack Eppel is not a very good guest. He just goes <laughs> on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I don't know how I got through the whole show. And on and on and on and on. Court looked pretty fucking bored over there. And on and on and on and on. Stapes was so excited to actually get time on his own show to speak after the break. And on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's see, we got one here. It says, "What's that court?" No, I was just gonna say we all like Jack a lot, but it was very obvious that uh, he he came in with a plan of being long-winded without saying much, and that's sadly enough. That's uh, you know a lot of times in business and politics, that's how things are handled these days, and uh, he definitely went that route. But we all still love Jack. But yeah, it was not the best interview we've ever done. <laughs> it was my fault. It was my fault. He was worried we were going to hit him on that ruling thing, and he was so nervous. Joe or Stapes had already sent me his prep stuff, so I let Jack read it so he'd know what he was going to be asked, so he ended up getting yeah. answers to those questions. I guess we can't here's do that anymore. The, no, Barry, we, can, we cannot do that. <laughs> here's the thing I don't understand about that situation is it's so obvious that they just blew the call. Why is it the end of the world? Why can't they just come up and say, hey, we, we made a bad call. Move on. It's over. That's what I don't understand. It's very uh, bizarre. Yeah, well, like this, like I think he whole, did. This whole nonsense like, oh, your hand's dead at one, that's utter bullshit, and we all know that. That's definitely not true. Yeah, I think what happened is initially he, he backed up his floor man. He wanted to say the guy didn't do anything wrong. And once he started down that path, he... He was having problems retracting it because it wasn't just yeah. the guy blowing the call; it's him backing his guy up and blowing that too. Right, but I mean, stuff uh, yeah. happens. I mean, nobody's gonna, you know. I mean, you know, I know, I know. the referees are always right. It's no big deal. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. look at the guy with, with exactly. I mean, a lot of people said the guy who blew the perfect game. He manned yeah, up. He said uh, blew it, and everyone looked at him as a great guy. You know that he right. he didn't try to waste a lot of it. It's no big deal. Stuff happens, man. It's, I mean, that's. I mean, when I saw it, I was just like, no big deal. Like, just say, hey, we blew the call, and it's over in five seconds. Especially in the poker world where we're so forgiving to everyone, cheaters and liars and thieves, <laughs> and they all come back with open arms, and they get sponsorship deals and every other thing in the world. Just say, hey, man, we're human beings. We made a mistake. Speaking of mistakes, <laughs> this is one that pertains specifically to me, but it is a question I'm glad someone asked because I'd like to answer it. It says, hey, Stapes. Uh, you love what you're doing on the big game, and I truly mean that. That being said, this is my attempt at some constructive criticism. I think you and Jimmy are doing a good job in the actual poker stuff, but one thing bothers me. I feel like your analysis often gives away the action before it happens. It's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is, but I often find myself thinking something like, oh, so he's not going to raise that when you start your commentary at a certain point in hand. Sometimes when you guess at what someone is thinking or might do, I get the feeling that you've gone over the entire hand trying to make the best possible sense of what does happen, and then maybe you forget some of the things that could have happened, at least from a spectator's perspective. He goes on to show one hand where I, I went ahead and, uh, and did that. One thing I like about Gabe Kaplan's commentary on High Stakes Poker is that he's pretty good at leaving it completely open, constantly saying things like he might be thinking about a crazy bluff or just a fold, etc., and sometimes with him, it's maybe a bit contrived when he acts very surprised. And he raises, I can't believe it. I'm not looking for that necessarily, nor am I any means looking for, oh, my gosh, man, he comes over the top style of commentary. But maybe you could try and think about whether you accidentally tip me the excited viewer off to what's going to happen, thus ruining the excitement 
prematurely. And then he says, obviously, most of the time it's great, blah, 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 but this is my issue. Sincerely, Jonas in Copenhagen, Denmark. Jonas, what I'd like to say to you is go fuck. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> we, tr- we try to do, you know, we're, we're trying to do something on the show that hasn't really ever been done before. Where we're trying to get as in-depth poker analysis within the short time that we have uh, as humanly possible. And a lot of the time, you're absolutely right. It would be difficult for me and or Jimmy to know what is going on in a particular hand unless we know what does happen. But a lot of the times, someone, when someone makes a crazy four bet all in and then the other person folds immediately, the hand's over and I don't have time to go back and explain it. And I really don't want to cheat you guys, the viewers, out of what is pretty accurate poker analysis uh, because of we're handcuffed to television. So what I try to do as often as I can is I will present both sides of it, and I will be a little bit leading as to what does happen because I want to be able to explain it to you guys. I think that that's sort of what makes our show unique uh, in that we do sort of get into the higher-level thinking that goes on in a lot of these hands, and it would be impossible to always go back and do it afterwards. So I try to slip it in where I can. But also, having said that, I am trying to get better at that. I am trying to get better at and genuinely, when Jimmy and I go into a hand and I go, well, there's no way he can call this, and then he doesn't call, that's genuinely what my feeling was uh, ahead of time. Uh-huh. And when I say there's no way he can call this and I turn out to be wrong, what we've been doing lately is we leave that in the show now too. And I go, there's no way he can call this, and then he calls it, I mean, and that's it, you know. And then I will try to, as quickly as I can, explain why it's such a crazy thing or why I didn't think it, and then why maybe he did do it, even though I didn't know it in the moment, you know, we'll try to figure out why, in fact, those things did happen. So I appreciate the email, and all I can tell you, Jonas, is that we're trying, and I, you know, I don't want to cheat people. I'd rather give away a little bit if I have to and still give that really good poker analysis that we're trying to get through on the PokerStars.net big game. Thanks for your email, Jonas. A uh, couple more quick little ones here. Looks like we lost Barry for the rest of the show. He'll be all right. I think he'll make it back to the States just fine. Just make sure he has his passport mm-hmm. and his money pinned to the inside of his sweater. He'll be fine. Uh, this is from Hughes. It said, Poker Maven VT, because you flunked out of Deep Stacks U. Thanks for that, Hughes. And one more fun little email before we go. This one says, I'm at work, and the All In For Jesus song is going round and round in my head, so I thought I'd take a practical approach to dealing with this problem. This is what happened. I want to go All In For Buddha. I want to go All In For Peace. I might achieve nirvana if this guy's got a weaker ace. I want to go all in for Krishna, all in for sacred cows. I want that guy to have a flush when I've got a full house. I want to go all in for Abraham, all in for the Torah. I want to achieve liberation from mortal toil and be eternally richer, not poorer. I could go on, but I'll spare you peace And I apologize to you, the author. I've had this email so long that your name has been chopped off in the meantime. But uh, that certainly brought a smile to my face and a chuckle to my belly. Corey Harrington, Joe Seabach, that's all the time we've got for Poker Road Radio. All in for hate. Oh, I guess that's it. That's all we're going to have. All in for Jesus' song. We'll let that song take you guys out for Barry Greenstein, for Courtney Harrington, for Joe Seabach, for our special guest, Tom Marchese. Thanks very much for everyone else traveling down the old poker road. This is Joe Stapleton saying. Always take the best of it. I want to go all in for Jesus. I want to go all in for love. If you live life by yeah. the book, you will float up a boat. I want to go all, all in, in with Jesus. I want to go all in with God. I'm just a man and I need to transcend this body. Oh, yeah. All in with Jesus. I want to go. All in with love. God's the best person, and he'll handle you with kickoffs.